Melania Luisa Marte is a weaver of worlds and of words. In her new book of poetry, Plantains and Our Becoming, she tackles everything from self-love to colonialism. Melania and I talk about centering Blackness in her identity and in her writing, and the very first poem she ever wrote that got her in a lot of trouble. Melania, congratulations on this book being out in the world. Thank you. (laughs) Since so much of your work deals with diaspora and displacement, I want to begin with your parents' story. Tell me about how it is that your mom and dad met. My parents met through an aunt of mine, my tia Leslie. She lived in Santo Domingo in the capital, and my mom ended up moving to the capital when she was like 18 or 19, I believe. She was just helping my aunt out by cleaning the house and like running errands and things. And one day my father called his brother, uh, my tío Ramón, who was married to my tía Leslie. And my mom ended up picking up the phone and he kind of was like, oh, like kind of like falling in love with her voice and like her wit. So he ended up flying to Santo Domingo to meet her and they started dating. I believe six months later, they ended up getting married. My father was already living in the United States. Um, he had a, an auto shop and he was a mechanic. He also was a teacher and he taught mechanic in English, French and Spanish. And so he kind of already had a career in New York. And so he wanted to bring my mother. This is how, you know, my immigration story comes about. Do you think your mom understood what she was giving up by moving to the United States? Oh, she completely did. I mean, she talks about it all the time. She tells me, she's like, you know, because now I'm a mother and I I chose to have my child in the Dominican Republic, but that's with the knowledge that he would gain dual citizenship and that he would be both a citizen of the Dominican Republic because by birth, but he would also, by my access in my American passport, he would gain his own American birth certificate and passport. Now as a mother, I understand the importance of doing what's best for your children. And my mother definitely made it clear to us that although we love traveling, we would go to the Dominican Republic every summer. She would remind us that I know you love it here, but just remember that you have a better quality of life in the United States. Melania, you were seven years old the last time you saw your dad? Yeah. Did you have time to process that he was dying? Or did it come as a surprise? Yeah, so he passed away um, in a drunken accident. So we literally spoke to him the day before, I believe. And then my mom got a call. And then we had to go to the Dominican. At this point, he's living in the Dominican Republic. And we had to just go to the Dominican Republic for the funeral. It was very like out of nowhere. And I literally, I have this vivid memory as a kid where we're on the plane on the way to the Dominican Republic. And I'm excited because I'm like, we're going to my grandma's house. We're spending the summer. And at one point where I'm like sitting on the plane, I have this vivid memory. My brother is like, what are you stupid? Papi just died. And then the student hit me and I was just like, oh, my God. You know, and I had this moment where I'm like crying. And so um, for many years, I had a hard time kind of talking about it. And I've kind of gotten to a space where I think, you know, especially through therapy, therapy helps guys go to therapy. I've gotten to a space where I've been able to, you know, use language and use poetry to kind of explore that and also heal that. I still feel his presence. I still feel parts of him in me. And so I try to honor that. I love that, especially as I think about you trying to piece together this sense of being and belonging. When did you start writing? So interestingly enough, my first poem, I... I plagiarized my first poem. My first poem was a copycat poem from my cousin Maciel. My mom had sent me to the Dominican Republic when I was like five or six. 
And um, my cousin Maciel loved writing poetry. And she used to write her little lover. She had a little boyfriend. She was like 12 or 13. She had a, like a little boyfriend. And I wanted to be just like her. I was like obsessed with her. I thought she was so beautiful. She is still so beautiful. She has this long wavy hair and her skin just glistens. And she always like wore like really clear lip gloss. And I was like, I want to be just like her. And she wrote a poem about wanting to kiss her boyfriend under the mango tree at my grandma's house. And I was like, ooh, that's a really great poem. And I tried to like copy her poem. And then when I got back home to New York, my journal was full of like these poems about kissing boys under mango trees. And my mom was like, shook. <laughs> my mom was like, what were you doing all summer? And she was like, I'm calling your grandma. And she was just like, no. That's how I got my first start writing poetry. And then I just kept writing all of high school into college. And I ended up um, dropping out of college to pursue poetry and to just pursue my writing. And now we're here. <laughs> Wait, that is a big choice. Yeah. <laughs> I just, well, when I was depressed, I didn't really know. I knew writing was my thing. I knew that's what I wanted to do. But I didn't really know how to navigate academia in a way that would benefit me in terms of poetry. And so I was just like, I'm going to take a break. So I ended up moving here to Dallas, where my mom was living at the time, and joining the Dallas Poetry Slam. And I didn't really understand slam poetry, because it's like the performance side of poetry. But with their help and with the community's help, I was able to really become a contender in the slam poetry community and ended up competing at Women of the World. I also competed at the Individual World Poetry Slam and made final stage on all of them. And I also competed with the team. And it really just put some fire under me to understand that this really can be a career. Like you can tour with your poetry, you can write books, you can do amazing things. And so I just kept really at it for like, I would say like five years, really five years of like hustle Granted, I had been writing my whole life, so I already had kind of like this, this body of work. How are you sustaining yourself while you're on this poetry hustle? Oh, working gigs. I would do performances. I would teach. I was also a teaching artist at the time, maybe getting paid 50 bucks a poetry show, you know? And then when I stepped into kind of doing conferences and I got a booking agent for college shows, that changed the game because then it's like, okay, well, I can budget now because I'm getting maybe, you know, $3,000 here, $5,000 here. So it's like, okay, now this is more sustainable. And then really my big break came in 2020 when I did, um, I wrote a commercial for McDonald's and that that gave me the financial aspect that I needed to really be able to sit down and just write. It gave me the freedom, the financial freedom to be like, you can take yourself seriously now because the money matches. What's up, everybody? I'm Steve R. Lewis, a licensed psychotherapist and host of How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything. I'm excited to share big news. How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything is back. This time, I'll be joined by a very special person, someone whose name you know very well. Hi, everybody. I'm Juleka Lantigua, founder of LWC Studios. Welcome, Juleka. I'm so excited. And by the way, I'll be taking notes. So many notes. As always, on the show, we get to hear stories from Black and brown folks who are out there doing great and amazing things. Then I do my thing of offering some feedback and strategies to help us navigate personal and professional challenges. Together, we'll figure out how to achieve on our own terms. Subscribe to or follow How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything everywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. On Twitter and Instagram, you can follow the show at Talk to Achievers. I want to give our listeners a sense of your poetry. Would you read Immigrant Math Problem for me? Of course. Immigrant math problem. If I give mama 5,000 pesos and mama gives 3,000 pesos to Theo for groceries and gas and Theo gives 1,000 pesos to La Colmadera for food, 500 pesos to El Pompeador for gas and 500 pesos to his son. And La Colmadera gives 200 pesos to her daughter for motoconcho fare to ride to school. And El Pompeador gives 300 pesos to his wife for breakfast and dinner ingredients. And Mama leaves 2,000 pesos for a small emergency. 
and keeps X amount of pesos in some nook and cranny that she calls a bank. And the bank is her home because she says the real bank that's owned by the government is unsafe. And at least in her home, she keeps the money buried right next to her loaded gun. And, and, and how much more money do you think we will collectively need to erase the centuries of disenfranchisement that plagues us? Mommy and Mama have always taught me money is like a waterfall for people like us. It must trickle down or else some of us will drown of thirst. I want a math problem that will teach me to make enough to save us all. I once heard it said that there's universality in specifics, and that is such a specific poem. And yet it captures the sense of how many of our families came here because they wanted to be able to send something back and they wanted that abundance to be shared. Mm -hmm. I love that what you're landing on is this question of, does it have to be this way? Do we accept the math as we have been taught it? Yeah. Or do we reimagine the calculus? Yeah. You know, that's something um, that's really beautiful what you just said. And I'm actually thinking about, I'm tearing up thinking about that because so my mother is moving. She She's on a flight right now as we speak. So I think it's it's just the beauty and timing. My mother is finally retiring from this country and she's moving back. But she's moving back to a whole new world because she came to this country. I mean, she was able to buy land. She was able to rebuild my grandmother's home from a wooden cabin into a, a really a grand home, you know? And she's so excited now after so many years, 40 plus years, 30 something plus years, she's able to do so much more, you know, and have so much more over there. And so I think when we talk about these things, we also like, it's like we have to pat ourselves on the back. The immigrant experience is sometimes filled with so much turmoil and just exhaustion And sometimes it does feel burdensome, you know, to have the weight of your family, especially if you're one of the only ones who was able to make it out of the country and into, you know, more prosperous country. But I also, what does that look like in 40 years? What does that look like in 50 years? What does that look like in 100 years? And so oftentimes I think about how you know, as things become more expensive here, that means that folks are sending less money back home. And what does that do for the infrastructure of countries who depend on a dollar being sent over? You know, how that impacts them. And oftentimes it creates more crime, it creates more difficulties. And so it's just really important for us to reimagine, like you said, reimagine what that can be. So much of your work, Melania, is grounded in your identity as a Black woman, as a Black Latina. You write you were 12 years old the first time you realized your friends and you saw the world differently. Do you remember what happened that crystallized that for you? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just so interesting because I grew up in New York City. um, And I know many, many Afro-Latinas are like, well, I didn't realize I was Black until like X, Y, and Z happened. But I grew up on the Lower East Side, so I didn't grow up with other Dominicans. I grew up with other Black folks and I grew up with Puerto Ricans and then a few white folks. And my Asian friends, you know, uh, a lot of my friends were from China. And so at a young age, I understood that I was navigating the world as a little Black girl. We have the same hair. We're listening to the same music. I grew up on, you know, like Aaliyah and Beyonce and Destiny's Child and like Missy Elliott. And so culturally, I was a regular, regular Black girl from New York City. And so in the poem um, on colorism, I'm exploring that because my friend, she feels seen in Latinidad. She is the typical looking Latina. You know, she's got the long wavy hair. She's mixed race. So she's able to just dip in and out of different identities And the complexities of our friendship kind of shifted once I realized that she was a little anti-Black. And I didn't know why. Because for me, it was like, we're all friends. We're all sisters, you know. But it was like, oh, there was a hierarchy. That if you had softer hair, if you had lighter skin, you know, if you were considered Latina and you could fit into Latinidad, you could be fetishized and romanticized. And if you were just a regular, regular Black girl, 
certain folks could feel like they can demean you and that they can degrade you and that they can pedestal themselves and feel like they are worthier than you are. And so that conversation really started with my friend and I at the time. She was being really mean in a racialized way. At the time, I didn't have the language, but I did say to her, like, why are you being so mean to Black girls? Like, what is it about Black girls that you're always picking on them? Or like, I have no control over my hair texture, my eye color, my skin color. I have no control over these things. These are the things I'm born with. They're, it's an inheritance. The conversation, what's missing is love for each other. Um, because I love myself, I'm able to love other Black women. And so my hope is that the conversation on colorism, the conversation on anti-Blackness within our communities, is that we remember that if we love ourselves, we have to love our kin. Among your poems are an ode to Cardi B, an ode to Amara La Negra. And I think one of the things that we're running up against very broadly is the limits of visibility. First, there is always a fight for visibility. I think what you're watching right now with the trans community is an example of this, where almost a decade ago you had Laverne Cox on the cover of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. And there was this feeling, it felt like an undeniable step forward. And now almost a decade later, you're watching a lot of those rights be reversed. Mm -hmm. So in this conversation about Blackness and about Afro-Latinidad, I wonder what you think it would look like to move past the point of representation and visibility and have an honest conversation instead about equity. It reminds me of a review I recently read on my book where um, a woman mentioned that she just said that my collection, I mean, it was a great review in a sense, but what, it bothered me a little bit that she said that um, my collection was a, uh, very um, almost obsessed with the trappings of capitalism and the um, and ownership. And I thought it was interesting because it's very difficult to talk about capitalism without talking about the fact that Black folks who were shipped here as cargo have never received their reparations. You know, in this collection, I explore reparations a lot. And this book is my reparations, okay? Because let's talk about the fact that this is a book deal that I got, a nice, hefty book deal that I got that gave me and my family so much more economic freedom. This life, I dreamt it up. I, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be here writing and getting paid to write. That just was not the trajectory that systemically was set up for me. When we talk about like equity, it's just like given the opportunity to dream and then given the money to make the opportunities happen. So in order for us to really get to a space where we can say, okay, representation is here and um, everyone is truly equal, we have to really look like, is everyone financially equal? You know, is everyone economically equal? Do our communities have access? Do our communities have the same amount of resources? It's very layered and it's very complicated. And so when the woman said that she's surprised because most poets of um, immigrant backgrounds talk about uh, colonialism as this, you know, and capitalism as this like really bad thing. And it is. And I do say it's a bad thing. But I also need to eat. And I think it's really unfair for us to put this burden of undoing capitalism on the folks who are most impacted by capitalism. And so recently I've been doing a lot of healing, um, and healing my pettiness, but really healing my, my, my inner soul. <laughs> but a lot of the healing um, I've had to do is forgive my ancestors and it's not, you know, the ones who were victims. I'm forgiving because people forget that Black folks also have white DNA. I have to forgive my ancestors who also did wrong. And so in order for me to get to a space where I can write about my joy, I also have to be able to release what weighs me down. We all have a part and a role in our own liberation and in our community's liberation and in the world's liberation. And so we have to really get to the root. And that's why I wrote this book, because <laughs> I wanted to get to the root. It is so good. You are such a blessing, Melania. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. 
Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>